Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Welcome to our first Sustainability Community Breakfast for 2016. I'm Malcolm Brody. I'm the mayor of the city of Richmond, and I also have the privilege of being the chair of the Zero Waste Committee at Metro Vancouver. Uh, and as ever for this session, we're, uh, we're grateful to Happy Planet for having donated the fresh juices. Now, we're going to kick off the series this morning and talk about the importance of recycling batteries and electronic advice, uh, devices. And we're going to hear from two organizations that are working hard to increase public understanding and actions around this issue. Now in BC, electronic recycling programs have grown steadily since the province uh, began including e-waste in the extended producer responsibility programs back in 2007. The original program started with televisions and computers, and many other product categories were added over the next five years. So we've gotten to the point where today, almost any electronic or electrical device with a cord or a battery can be recycled, and that does include the battery. Recycling is important so we can retrieve valuable components and we also want to keep chemicals and metals from entering the environment. Metro Vancouver, as part of our solid waste and resource management plan, has been playing an active role in supporting the existing EPR programs, as well as encouraging the implementation of future such programs. So we've got three speakers who are going to speak to us this morning. Our first speaker, who is simply going to speak to us about a bit of the background, is Andrew Marr. He's the Director of Solid Waste Planning at Metro Vancouver, and he'll provide a bit more background about Metro Vancouver's role in developing the Take Charge initiative. Now, once Andrew has spoken, we will then hear from Kristen Romilly. Kristen is the Western Canada Director for Call to Recycle Canada. Kristen oversees the provincially mandated consumer battery collection program in the province, and she seeks opportunities for development, uh, business development in Alberta and Saskatchewan. She works closely with stakeholders to maximize battery diversion from the landfill and ensure safe and responsible recycling. And the final speaker will be Craig Weishart. Craig is the Western Canada Executive Director for the Electronic Pro Products Recycling Association, and he's been with that program since 2011. Now, Kristen and Craig are both involved with the stewardship agencies of BC. Kristen is the current chair, and Craig is the past chair. This organization, the Stewardship Agencies of BC, is an organization that promotes coordination among BC's stewardship agencies and it facilitates their interactions with the stakeholders. So uh, I want to thank you for being here. We're going to turn it over to our speakers. We'll hear from Andrew first and then we'll hear from Kristen and Craig. And following that time, it'll be your term, turn for your questions and we'll have a lively discussion. So, over to you, Andrew. Where are you? There you are. Andrew. Thank you, Director Brody. Uh, good morning. Um, when I was working in the, back when I was working in the battery industry in the 80s, um, I should clarify that's the 1980s, um, the, the whole concept of collecting and recycling batteries was uh, a completely foreign uh, idea. Um, back in the 80s, we were only just beginning to recycle paper and cardboard and the easy things. <clears throat> um, when EPR came in for, for batteries and electronic waste in 2007, uh, back then our best estimate was that uh, batteries and electronic waste together uh, made up about 3.2% 3, 3 of the waste that people were disposing of from their homes and businesses. Um, since 2007, we've come a long way. Uh, now, uh, electronic waste and batteries together make up only about 1% of the waste that people are throwing out. Um, so there's a huge improvement. And though, you know, 1% doesn't sound like a whole lot, and it's not a big percentage, uh, 
it's a disproportionately uh, impactful percentage because batteries and electronic waste contain um, heavy metals and, and other substances that are, are of concern uh, if they're not handled properly. Um, so obviously Metro Vancouver and the stewardship agencies had a, a shared interest in keeping these things out of the environment and making sure that, that these heavy metals and other compounds were being uh, uh, recycled and managed properly. Um, <clears throat> the EPR groups that are involved in this area, they, they do operate for the most part independently. Um, and so in, in this situation, Metro Vancouver's role was to act as a convener. And so we brought together uh, several different EPR groups that were involved in the management of batteries and electronic waste. And uh, the result is the Take Charge program that you're going to be hearing about today, as well as uh, you'll be getting the chance to get a good picture of the two key EPR programs in this area, uh, Call to Recycle and the Electronics Products Recycling Association. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Just bear with me as I get situated here. So again, good morning. I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you about Call to Recycle and our battery stewardship program, our collection and recycling program, as well as the importance of recycling your batteries. Did you know that the average Canadian uses six battery-powered devices every day? And as our dependence on technology grows, so does the waste that we create, which only highlights our need to recycle materials. Great, I got the right uh, clicker, I'm happy. <laughs> so this morning I'm gonna walk you through a little bit about who we are at Call to Recycle and what we do. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about our program in action, um, including what we collect and our collection results today, as well as our initiatives, including the Take Charge campaign. And then we'll walk through what happens to your batteries once you drop them off for recycling. So Call to Recycle was established in uh, just over 20 years ago um, in the U.S. at the behest of rechargeable battery manufacturers. And really their intent was to ensure that the the products that they were manufacturing were being handled responsibly at the end of their life. In 1997, Call to Recycle began accepting rechargeable batteries here in Canada. And in 2010, when Call to Recycle Stewardship Plan was approved in British Columbia, we became the official program um, for single use and rechargeable uh, batteries in this province. With over 1,600 collection locations throughout the province, 95% of British Columbians have access to a collection facility within 15 kilometers of the residence. And we offer um, collection uh, facility or collection drop off not only to the public, but um, to private businesses as well. So you're likely wondering what kind of batteries uh, do we collect and recycle? And in essence, what we do is collect any battery you would typically find in your household. So consumer batteries weighing less than five kilograms each. These include um, single-use batteries, otherwise known as primary batteries. These would be your alkaline batteries uh, that you find in your remote controls or in the fobs for your cars, uh, or sorry, for the toys um, that your kids play with, or the little lithium primary batteries, those little button cells that are often found in your watch. And we also collect rechargeable batteries. Now, there's a long list of the types of batteries that we do collect, but to highlight a couple, um, we collect nickel cadmium batteries. Those batteries are often found in your power tools, um, the packs that power your tools, as well as lithium ion batteries, often found in electronics, often embedded in them. So why is it important to recycle your batteries? Well, as we know, batteries don't last forever. Um, once you've used a, an alkaline battery, you no longer have a use for it if it doesn't have a charge left. And rechargeable batteries, um, ha you can charge them about a thousand times. They last for about two to five years, depending on the product and the use. So once you're done with them, they become a waste. And it's really important to recycle your batteries for a number of reasons. One, to reduce the amount of waste going to landfill. The second is that batteries can really contain potentially harmful metals and materials, and we really want to keep those out of landfill. 
And the third is by recycling your batteries, we're reducing the dependency on mining for virgin materials. So most British Columbians, as I mentioned, live, live within 15 kilometers of a drop-off location. And here in Metro Vancouver, um, that distance is much shorter. And collection facilities are really easy to locate. Um, we work with many retailers, including London Drugs, Best Buy, The Home Depot, Staples, Rona, et cetera, where you can drop off your batteries free of charge. You can also find call-to-recycle drop-off points at many municipal depots or um, at bottle depots and most commonly where other materials are available for return such as electronics. To find the nearest drop-off location to you, there are a couple of really easy ways to find out your nearest location. The first is by visiting um, our website, so a small plug for Call to Recycle here, call to recycle.ca, where there's a locator tool where you can just pop in your postal code and it will generate the um, closest locations to you or there's a fantastic tool on the Recycling Council of British Columbia's website called rcbc.com, called the Recyclopedia, and you can put in a number of materials that you're curious about returning, and it will generate as well the closest locations to you. Our goal here really is to divert as many batteries as possible and to divert the harmful materials that may enter our solid waste stream. Since 2010, Call to Recycle has made great strides in the effort to divert batteries. So since 2010, since our program um, launched here for all batteries, all consumer batteries, we've collected over 2.3 million kilograms of batteries in British Columbia, and that's since 2010, with our most successful year being uh, this past year, 2015, where we collected close to 630,000 kilograms of batteries. And to give you a Metro Vancouver context, um, since the program launched uh, in 2010, we've collected over 1 million kilograms of batteries. So when you think about the size of an average battery and the weight, it's um, not an insignificant amount. But while you know, we're, we're very happy and, and proud of, of the amount that we've collected, we still realize that there are still batteries going to landfill, and we're committed to increasing collections year over year. We continue to spread awareness about the necessity of battery recycling and aim to divert batteries from landfill and really get them out of people's basements and garages where they're collecting dust. And as I mentioned earlier, um, batteries, by recycling batteries, we're reducing the dependency on mining for virgin materials. And so there's a really good reason to get those batteries out of your basements and landfills and bring them in for recycling. So I just want to touch on a few of the campaigns um, that we've done at Call to Recycle to raise awareness, and that's something that we're going to continue to do um, to really engage the public and educate them about the um, importance of recycling batteries. So um, you'll see at the bottom, the bottom banner is National Battery Day, and that's just around the corner on February 18th. And for us, we're really going to be raising awareness and, and calling people to action to recycle their batteries. We'll be holding contests and offering prizes to those who recycle batteries. So if you're interested in participating or one of those who have uh, batteries in your basements or in your garages, all you have to do to enter our contest is drop off your batteries, take a picture of yourself at a recycling uh, facility, and post it to social media using the hashtag NBD which is National Battery Day 2016, and uh, you're automatically entered for some awesome prizes. We also find it incredibly important and rewarding to engage with kids. And in that vein, we've partnered with Earth Rangers and Earth Day Canada and sponsor Science World BC Green Games to get the message into BC classrooms around not only the importance about recycling batteries, but the importance of recycling in general. We've also done two other campaigns this year. Um, the, the image um, with the little guy holding the battery was um, a campaign that we did around Waste Reduction Week and we worked with Science World on that campaign. And we awarded some great prizes for, um, for the folks that brought in the most uh, batteries. And we also did another campaign, which is the one at the top, um, that was around daylight savings, and we partnered with Rona on this. And the impetus there and, and was to really get people thinking about tying battery recycling and turning in your batteries to when we turn the clocks back. So switching out the batteries out of your smoke detectors and returning them for recycling. Our message around recycling 
cannot exist in a vacuum. And cooperation and collaboration is key to our success. So Culture Recycle uh, participates in a number of initiatives. Um, we are a member of the stewardship agencies of BC, an organization of product stewards, and those product stewards manage hundreds of, um, of products in the province. And we work on common issues with key stakeholders, but really all the stewards, are our main mandate and um, is to divert as much as possible from landfill and recycle those products responsibly. Outside of the stewardship agencies of British Columbia, we also work with other stewardship agencies such as Craig's group, EPRA, um, to work with their processors to ensure that we're recycling the batteries that are embedded in electronic devices and ensuring that those are done responsibly. Our latest um, collaborative effort is the, it's one that I'm actually really excited about, is the BC Recycles Summer Ambassador Tour. And what's happened there is we've, a bunch of stewards have gotten together, and what we do is we support a, two teams of two students to travel around the province throughout the summer to attend community events and spread the word around recy about recycling in British Columbia. Collaborative relationships with local government are also incredibly key to success. So this banner at the bottom is the Take Charge campaign that Andrew mentioned earlier. And this campaign was initiated by Metro Vancouver and is aimed at diverting uh, both batteries and battery powered devices from landfill. Together with Metro Vancouver, Call to Recycle, EPRA, the electronics group, um, the small appliance group, CESA, and Recycle My Cell, the cell phone recycling group, have come together to encourage uh, Metro Vancouver residents to recycle batteries and battery powered devices. The campaign includes a link um, that will take residents to a website, which is bcrecycles.ca, where they can find a convenient location to recycle all of their unwanted steward stewarded materials. So now that you know a little bit about Call to Recycle and our initiatives, you might be wondering what do we do with those batteries once you drop them off and how can you be sure that they are re recycled responsibly? Call to Recycle is the first battery recycling program to obtain R2 certification, otherwise known as responsible recycling. And we also have recognition um, from e the eSteward program by the Basel Action Network. These certifications affirm our commitment to proper downstream management of batteries, and include. Then this includes not exporting um, batteries to developing countries or sending materials to landfill. <clears throat> As part of this requirement, Call to Recycle also adheres to ISO 14001, which relates to environmental management systems. We also undergo third-party audits to provide assurance that the batteries you drop off are being responsible. Res recycled responsibly. So all batteries that you drop off in BC are sent to Trail British Columbia for sorting. And once those batteries are sorted um, by chemistry, they're sent to different processors across North America for processing. And that includes staying here in BC at some Did you know processors. You <laughs> Uh, the, ba the battery recycling process used by Call to Recycle seeks uh, to ensure that materials extracted from batteries can be used in the manufacturing of new products. Our processors meet or exceed global recycling standards and no portion of any battery that you drop off is ever landfilled. So with that, I'm going to take a pause and a sip of water and I uh, would like to um, show you a brief video that outlines the methods um, used by Call to Recycle battery processors. Canada. Recycling helps to divert batteries from ending up in our landfills, and reusing them helps to save our valuable resources. With Call to Recycle, batteries never die. Call to Recycle collects and recycles over 5 million kilograms of batteries each year. That's the weight of over a thousand elephants. When you drop off batteries, they're brought to one of the 34,000 collection sites across Canada and the USA. At sorting facilities, Batteries are separated according to type and chemistry. There are two common types of consumer batteries, rechargeable and single use. Each type is sent to different processing facilities across North America. Batteries are fed by conveyor belt into an automated crusher to separate usable chemicals and metals, then melted down at high temperatures in a huge furnace. Molten metal is deposited into large and small molds called pigs and hogs. Recovered metals include cobalt, lead, 
nickel, iron, cadmium, and zinc. The metal is used to make a variety of stainless steel products, new batteries, cement additives, rubber, paint, ceramic, and so much more. Battery recycling is not just our business, it's our mission. Visit calltorecycle.ca to find a location near you. Call to Recycle. Recharging the planet, recycling your batteries. So thank you so much for your time this morning and I hope that I've left you with some valuable information about the importance of battery recycling and um, some information about Call to Recycle. If you're interested in learning more, I would encourage you to visit our website, calltorecycle.ca or give us a call. Um, we'd love to uh, chat with you about any questions you may have. So again, thank you very much for your attention this morning and I look forward to your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Number two, right? Good. Good morning. Thanks, uh, everybody, for uh, coming out and uh, listening to what we have to say. I, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that there won't be a lot of overlap with what Kristen said. Uh, uh, but uh, in reality, the stewardship programs run in similar fashions, and a lot of the, uh, the material that you saw there is, uh, is similar to what we do, particularly the uh, consumer awareness and some of that stuff and the joint programs we participate in. Uh, so yes, as you said, I'm Craig Weishart uh, with the Electronic Products Recycling Association and uh, we do just that. We recycle electronics in the uh, province of British Columbia. As Mayor Brody said uh, earlier, the regulations have been in place since uh, 2007 uh, and uh, uh, those computers and television sets uh, that he talked about were our program. So we were one of the first uh, uh, programs certainly around electronics and uh, uh, really the core of those regulations are to, uh, uh, to obligate stewards and transfer that responsibility to, uh, to them to, uh, to recycle uh, uh, electronics, and that's, uh, that's really what we do. So the, the industry stewards, who are the actual obligated parties, in a sense, uh, award the management of that program to EPRB, EPRABC, and that's us. Uh, and uh, really our mission and goal is to effectively and efficiently recycle uh, uh, electronics, uh, keep them out of landfill, and, uh, and also to uh, prevent illegal export. Uh, EPRA represents around 1,700 stewards, so uh, the obligation net in BC is broad. Uh, that's mostly uh, uh, retailers and, um, and producers of electronics that are, uh, that are sold in BC. Uh, just to give you some context, this is uh, EPRA nationally, and uh, uh, EPRA is the, uh, the program or it manages the program in all of the provinces with the exception of uh, Alberta and a new program that's starting in, uh, in the Northwest Territories. Uh, there's a program uh, due to start up for us in, no in New Brunswick, which is the last province uh, to initiate regulations around electronics that should happen. Uh, about the middle of next year. I think the uh, target date right now is August of uh, 2016. And this is also just a quick snapshot to show you some of the other provinces and, uh, uh, and the amounts of electronics that are recycled. Uh, uh, this is a lot dependent on size of the province and lengths of the program, but uh, what you'll see is that BC uh, certainly is among the uh, largest recyclers of electronics in Canada uh, at uh, uh, around 140-ish thousand uh, tons uh, in BC uh, uh, in, since program inception. Um, and as I said, uh, that, uh, that basically represents about 20 million devices, uh, 150 million kilograms uh, of material, uh, uh, which has I think as Andrew alluded to, has come for the most part directly out of landfill. That is material that prior to 2007 likely would have wound up in a landfill and, uh, and no longer does. So we're really proud of that and uh, as Kristen said, uh, um, it's good to look back and say yes we've done this but uh, and more and more we're focused on going forward and how do we uh, enhance that and how do we get more people to participate in the program and, uh, and get material out of, uh, continue to get more material out of landfill. 
Um, just on a yearly basis, 2014 is the last year we have stats for, but about 3.5 million devices um, uh, came out of landfill uh, and were cycled in 2014. And again, that's about 1,900 metric tons a month uh, that we recycle in the province. So you see the stats there at the bottom, those are 2014, so the last audited year we have. So about 22,700 metric tons of material was recycled in BC. Um, and about, just about half of that came from Metro Vancouver. Um, we, one of the measures we use is a kilo per capita measurement. So basically that uh, in the province of British Columbia, that averages out to 4.9 kilos for every uh, resident uh, in the province. Doesn't mean much out of context, but that is a fairly internationally recognized measure. And if you look uh, particularly in, uh, in North America, that number would be among the best uh, recycling rates in North America. And it, it actually compares well with EU, uh, European Union, where they've been doing recycling for a lot longer than we have here in North America. Um, Metro Vancouver is just a little under the provincial average, comes in around 4.5, and uh, uh, there's some reasons for that uh, that, uh, that we uh, have been working to address, but uh, uh, believe that, uh, that, that we actually have some opportunities in, uh, in Metro Vancouver that maybe are not as, as apparent as in some other areas of the province. Um, as Kristen alluded to, we have very good coverage. That's one of the things that, uh, that encourages uh, recycling is, uh, is the ability to do so efficiently. Um, our standard is, uh, is 30 minutes, a depot within 30 minutes in a metro area and 45 in a rural area. Uh, using that metric, we cover 98% of the, uh, the BC population, uh, which accounts for about 220 drop-off locations. 170-ish of those are, are actual depots, and the other 50 or so would be returned to retail locations. Again, of the 170, probably like there's 68 that are in Metro Vancouver, and a, a really significant portion of the return to retail um, is, in, uh, is in the Metro Vancouver area. And actually, uh, that was you know, one of the areas that we've ramped up recently. Uh, we, we really got serious into return to retail only over the last couple of years and have brought on uh, both Best Buy and Staples as, uh, as return to retail partners. And, uh, uh, and that's been really successful for us, particularly in, in, in places like the city of Vancouver, where it's extremely difficult to site depots. Uh, you know, you get into uh, zoning and, and everybody wants the depot close, they just don't want it too close. <laughs> and so, you know, as sure as you want to site a depot there, all of the people within a, you know, five block radius turn out to say, no, we don't want the depot there. We just would like it five blocks over. So. That, uh, that's been a real challenge for us and one of the reasons that we've worked uh, so hard to get return to retail uh, going in, uh, in Metro Vancouver. Um, 2014, we collected about 400,000 kilos in, uh, in return to retail, and again, uh, a good portion of that came, uh, came from Metro Vancouver. So uh, uh, that's good convenience, and we're, uh, we're really keen to uh, continue that program. Uh, Kristen talked uh, a lot about this, and, and uh, uh, I sort of anticipated that and didn't put up a bunch of the same logos and, and programs that she did, but uh, BC Green Games and, uh, and the Stewardship uh, uh, Tour, uh, Ambassador Tour, were participating in all of those events. And we, we really do see awareness and, and informing the public as a, as a key part of stewardship. I mean, that really we see as one of our primary uh, I'll say next to actually recycling the material, promoting awareness and making sure that people understand the right things to do uh, really are part of our core mission. And so uh, uh, that, you know, that revolves around, you know, making sure they know where the depots are, making sure they know what are acceptable products. Um, we've, we've sort of nuanced that now more into the why and the how of recycling. Uh, uh, I didn't bring my video and perhaps should have, but uh, you know, that, that is one of the things that we're looking to do is, is make sure, a lot of times when I do presentations, one of the questions I get is, is, that's great, we take it down to the depot, but what happens to it after that? And, uh, and so some of our awareness now is, is shifting toward trying to make sure that people understand what happens to it uh, once they give it to us. Um, but uh, awareness is good. Uh, our latest surveys show that 80% uh, that, uh, of the BC population knows 
uh, of an e-recycling program and, and what to do with the material. So that, uh, that number is pretty good. Uh, and uh, uh, again, we're always working to try and, and improve those numbers and, and, and get to the demographics. That's one of the things that we've really dialed it down to uh, uh, that, are, that are problem, I'll say, demographics. Those, uh, those 18 to 30-year-old males that use a lot of electronics but maybe aren't as keen a recyclers as... Uh, uh, old people like I am. So uh, that's, you know, that, that's something, again, we're nuancing and trying to target more our, our, our advertising toward those people that, uh, that have poor demographics. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this, but uh, Kristen, again, talked about the importance of making sure that, uh, that we know what happens to it, it's, it, the material after it's been collected. Um, it's good to, to say this is what we do with it, uh, but it's also it's as important or probably more important that you actually audit that and make sure that you do know and can verify uh, what's happened in the material. And we have a, a national group that does that, our Recycler Qualification Program, um, and all of the material that we recycle can only be recycled through, pro, uh, through processors approved under that program. And we don't just audit the primary processors. When you think about a television set and breaking it down, uh, right, it will go to a primary recycler and they'll take that big plastic cover. You're talking about the old CRT TVs that are as big as this podium, right? You take that plastic cover off, and then once you've got that off, you've got this giant picture tube, and there's all the circuit boards, and there's this giant wire of uh, a coil of, uh, of copper wire behind it. So all of that stuff is broken down, and the copper and the aluminum go to smelters and recyclers. The plastics go down a different stream. That glass has uh, a lead in it. It's leaded glass, or at least a portion of it is. And so that potentially is a, a substance of concern, and so that goes down another stream. In fact, a separate stream than non-leaded glass. And so all of that process, including the downstreams, are audited, and we think that that's, uh, that's an important part of the process so that uh, uh, people can have confidence that, uh, that this material is going to the right places and that we know what happens to it. Um, again, Kristen alluded to this earlier, but uh, the province has, uh, has taken a more active role in this and has required stewards uh, to provide third-party assurance on that. So that's, uh, that's a big part of what we do now. Uh, and, and last year, we've been auditing the uh, reporting of numbers like the number of collection depots and the, material, the amount of material recycled and those types of things for a number of years. But last year was the first year that there was third-party uh, audit on the actual downstream processes. So uh, uh, we think that's good. We see that as a positive uh, thing. We would like for the process to be a little less onerous, and the, and the province is working with us on that. But in, in general, I think the stewards really do support the, this, this third-party process and, uh, and ensuring that, that, that not only the government but the consumers of BC have confidence in the, the numbers that we were reporting and the, the, uh, the downstream and what happens to that material once we have uh, taken it in. Um, looking forward, uh, I was looking at uh, Kristen's graph and I saw the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger every year and, and that's, that's really been the history of our program since 2007. We've had year over year increases every year until this year. And we actually had a decline in the amount of electronics collected in 2014 over, uh, over 2013. And uh, surprisingly we see that as a positive because what it means is that the front end. So, you know, if you look at the three R's, you have reduce, reuse, and recycle, and the very top R is, is the reduce. And, and really, I'd say, as I can't think of another industry um, that has done as much as the electronics industry has in that, in that area. Now, some of that has nothing to do with environmental, you know, purpose, although some of it directly does, but a lot of it just has to do with the fact that electronics have, over the last 15 or 20 years, gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, the example I've got here is a desktop computer that became a laptop, that became a tablet, that became a smartphone. The other thing that you, that you think about is how many people here actually still own a camera that isn't attached to your phone? And yet, a number of years ago, you would have had almost everybody in the room say, yes, I've got a camera, because it wasn't attached to your phone. So those, that kind of consolidation of, of electronics is another thing uh, that, is, that is happening. 
TVs in particular, and this is where the big reduction has come for us, and the big, I'd, I'd say the big improvements in, uh, uh, in both the size but also the technology have come in, uh, in TVs and displays. Um, you, know, you look at, at what would have been a, probably a, a 32 or 36 inch TV you know, 15 years ago, how big was that thing? It, two people to carry it out, and now you can put it under your arm. Um, the other thing that, that is really, uh, I think, essential and really important in this area is the technology. You know, if you go back to the old CRT cathode ray picture tube TVs of the, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s, um, I, I talked about the leaded glass that's in those picture tubes. But in addition to that, there was a lot of things like uh, fire retardant plastics, the polybrominated plastics. Those things are worthless. No recycler wants polybrominated plastics. Um, and so what you saw is, a, is, a, is the next generation of plasma TVs and the early flat screen LCDs. So the, the plastics and some of that material was gone. The lead was gone. The problem with those is they were backlit with mercury uh, light bulbs. Um, and the latest technology, uh, the, uh, the LED uh, technology, all of that is gone. So really you have a very environmentally clean unit with a much smaller footprint. And, and that's what we're starting to see. So we're seeing the impact of smaller lightweight material. The number of devices that we collect continues to go up. Uh, the amount of depots we have continues to grow, but the tonnage is, is starting to flatten out. And as I said earlier, we see that as a, uh, as a positive and not a negative. So uh, yeah, uh, our mission going forward is, uh, is to continue to work with the ministry, with local government, uh, and all the stakeholders really to ensure that uh, the, the stewardship model uh, uh, continues to be cost effective, consumer friendly, um, and uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we and uh, uh, Calder Recycle and a number of other agencies have formed the stewardship agencies of BC to help coordinate our efforts to do some of those joint projects that uh, uh, that Kristen talked about and to, uh, and to make sure that uh, it's easier uh, in some ways for local government uh, uh, to interact with us. So uh, yeah, in the end, we're, uh, we're really looking to build an efficient uh, consumer-friendly system that uh, encourages uh, the uh, recycling of end-of-life electronics. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Just before we get into q and I just want to reflect, <clears throat> as the chair of uh, Metro Vancouver's Zero Waste Committee, uh, we really have seen the effects of more batteries going into the waste stream over the last few years. It's like exponentially increased. Uh, and I guess each one of us suffers from that, uh, the dilemma. I mean, when you've got a big TV and you've got to get rid of it, you consider the recycling options, and we're pretty much all into cardboard and paper recycling that's just automatic. But when you've got this tiny little battery, just this really little thing, I mean, it's not going to make much difference if I just throw it away. And so unless you have a specific place in your house where you collect those batteries and you deal with them in an effective way, uh, it, you know, it just adds to the situation. The other thing I, I would briefly add is uh, for those of you with the, uh, the iPhones and the other smartphones, uh, there's a Metro Vancouver app called We Recycle. And uh, in addition to the ones that have been mentioned here this morning, that is a really good app. Uh, I was just looking, as the speakers were talking, I was looking at batteries and, you know, did you know that uh, 0.3 of a kilometer from here, there's a London drug, so we'll take your battery. So it will, you know, it's location specific and uh, you can, uh, use a whole myriad of different products finding out where you can get that recycled. So you may want to take that into account. We Recycle is what the app is called. So with that, uh, we've got some time for Q&A. So uh, uh, you've probably mostly been here before, but the routine is just put your hand up and uh, one of the good folks from Metro Vancouver, will Jane, will recognize you and uh, give you the microphone in due course. So I see... We have a, Don is here with the microphone. I've had an e-father of sable fish. 
expressing appreciation of the privilege of gathering here. Acknowledgement was competently done yesterday evening at UBC Robson and tomorrow morning in Richmond at UBC Boathouse will be competently done again. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, seven-year-old boys uh, working 17 hours a day for a dollar a day in unsafe conditions mining in Africa, but uh, I'll ask about the, uh, the trail to and from trail. It's obvious, of course, why it goes there. Wondering what the business plan is. I mean, obviously, what they do in trail, there's uh, value stuff which is retrieved. So is it uh, a sustainable business plan just in terms of the revenue that's generated uh, equating to the cost, or is there any, any sort of uh, supportive, uh, supportive input there? And my second question is, uh, what does the phrase uh, North America mean? Does uh, North America include Mexico, Mexico and uh, if it does with the... Uh, stuff that goes on in Mexico with uh, cartels and so on is uh, auditing Mexico. That's uh, part of what needs to be done. Is that, uh, is that feasible? Who would like to respond? It, is this on? Is it working? Okay. Um, for our program, we currently we don't have any processors um, from in Mexico, um, but we use North America in terms of our scope for what we collect as um, we likely in the U.S. do get some batteries recycled in from Mexico. Um, from a trail perspective and using retrieve, we find that it is a, it's a great job creator to keep, a lot, to keep processing and sorting in the province. And um, we feel that it is a, a sustainable uh, model and seek to um, bring more jobs to British Columbia as we continue to grow. Does government support any of that, uh, or is it just private enterprise uh, finding the markets? In terms of where the batteries are processed? Yeah, the trail. That trail? It's uh, a business decision. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Uh, government stays out of uh, that portion in terms of our, yeah. our processing. I think that's pretty universal, frankly. All right, who would like to ask another question? The gentleman in the back. Just another comment on the trail situation. So trail was chosen because that's where the smelter is? Trail, so in terms of retrieve technologies, which is our sorter, and they're also um, one of the only lithium battery processors in North America. So they, are, they put in a bid, they were audited to a Chumeg standard, um, which is a very intensive downstream audit process and were approved by um, Calter Cycle as a, a sorter and a processor. So with a little bit of ignorance of uh, BC geography, I asked my person sitting next to me here, and she explained to me the trail was possibly the middle of the province, close to the U.S. border. Are there any facilities closer than a uh, trail that this stuff could be sorted in? Have we thought about that? There certainly have. So we've just actually completed an RFP process um, where we've put out bids for, it was a North America-wide um, focused specifically on Canada and the U.S. for um, companies to put in their bids to either sort or process batteries. Um, and um, those uh, results have not yet been released, so I can't comment on, on it uh, right now. But, um, of course, if there are um, facilities that are capable of doing um, the sorting and the processing as per the recycling standards, of course, we would seek those options. But I take it that you... It wasn't that, that any group went out and said, we want to take these materials to trail. It's you ask for proposals, and they come in from various places, and those private enterprises find the markets and, and then are able to tell you what the financial terms for them taking that product off your hands. Correct, yeah. yeah. This gentleman here. Um, yeah, this uh, question, I guess, relates to the, the business plan. There was um, uh, quite a lack of uh, any financial information on these slides. And so I'm quite interested in that. So where's the funding come from? Sounds like you're paying processors, right? And so the, this isn't a profitable, there, there's no downstream revenue. So then there's got to be upstream, uh, somebody's paying to do this. So could you just explain where the money flows a little bit for us? I mean, with regards to, I mean, there's a lot of poundage figures, but I'm much more interested in sort of how this is costing us. 
Sure, I can start with uh, with my program anyway, uh, uh, because there is some differences in in the way the programs are funded, and and if you look at uh, the lead acid battery program, uh, it is self funding because the there's value enough in the lead acid batteries to uh, uh, that there's no upstream, as you call it, which is a good word for it, no upstream cost because the, the, the residual product has value. But with electronics specifically, while there is value in the product, the value, the total value of the materials retrieved from the products does not cover the cost of, uh, of collection, transportation, and proper recycling. So as you suggest, there is an upstream uh, uh, funding for that, and that's, uh, that's done through, in our case, a, uh, uh, a visible fee on electronic sold. So effectively, the purchasers of electronics are the ones who are paying for the, uh, the, uh, the recycling of the, on the downstream end. Um, on the financial side, actually, if you hit check our website, uh, Chris had suggested uh, uh, ours is just uh, uh, EPRA uh, uh, .ca, uh, and you can look under BC. Uh, but uh, uh, all of our funding is there uh, because because of the fact that we collect uh, money from the consumers. Then there's a requirement that we have financial audits public. Uh, and um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I'd say is important to us, uh, um, you know, probably the most important thing we do is, is efficiently and effectively and, and environmentally soundly recycle the electronics. But one of the other things that we see as a primary obligation on our part is ensuring that there's good value in that. And, uh, you know, if you look at the costs over the years, uh, going back to, uh, you know, maybe uh, not 2007, but uh, uh, 2010 or 11, uh, you've seen our cost per ton come down in the, in the 30 to 40 percent range as we have been, you know, very aggressive in making sure that we uh, do competitive bids and those kinds of things. So, you know, on the financial side, we are confident that we're providing good value uh, and that we are getting the best uh, dollar. Uh, right now, commodity markets are terribly bad and um, and our processors are really suffering some of those guys who are locked into two and three year contracts are coming to us saying uh, yes we had no idea that metals prices could ever get this bad so uh, um, you know the the cost of doing this varies but uh, in general uh, we believe we've got a good efficient uh, program from our program perspective transparency from the financial side is key um, and again to Craig's point on our website we have all of our financial information available. Our program is slightly different than Craig's in that we're funded by industry so the battery manufacturers support the program and again to Craig's point um, some of the materials some of the batteries have very low residual value and so it is um, covered by the battery manufacturer to ensure that uh, the, the materials are processed appropriately. Yes, ma'am. Um, considering how multicultural Vancouver is, I was just wondering what um, kind of outreach you have in other languages? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, obviously, we, we look to get the biggest bang for the buck, and that, uh, that often is uh, um, uh, advertising on TV and places like that in, in English. Uh, but we certainly have done uh, um, advertising in... Uh, uh, in Chinese language uh, newspapers in particular. Um, we've done some work in, uh, in uh, 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 Aboriginal communities uh, and places like that. Not so much in advertising, but outreach in, in uh, uh, Bella Bella is a good <coughs> example where we've actually worked with uh, uh, Aboriginal Affairs to help put in recycling programs in some of those, uh, those locations. So um, again, I, it's it's you know incumbent on us to get as much product as we can in a lot of cases that is hitting the big markets but uh, but at least from our program's perspective we've tried um, very much to ensure that we broaden that uh, that outreach to uh, to include people that maybe aren't native English speakers uh, as well um, and that's certainly going to be part of our our outreach plan moving forward. Um, really, the first five years of the program was really setting up the infrastructure, um, and the next phase of our program is really that hitting that awareness piece um, 
incredibly hard, as, as Craig alluded to in his presentation, that's really um, secondary to collecting the batteries, making sure people are aware of the programs is incredibly key. And so we'll certainly be uh, shifting our focus in terms of awareness to outreach to uh, communities where English may not be the first language spoken. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, the one question I have is you were very good at outlining how how much, how many products, the, the kilograms of product that were actually recycled. But I'm really interested in finding out what the metal, the, the kilograms of metals that were actually recovered. So again, it's, uh, that, that information is on our website. Um, um, the report, we do, all of us do a report each year, an annual report to the province. And um, so if you look on our site, it's under the annual report to the director. Um, and, and under that, as part of this new third party auditing thing, these are actually now audited numbers. It, it gives the breakdown of, of the material and it's gonna vary by program. Um, as I said, a surprisingly large amount of the material that, uh, that's output from our program is glass. People wouldn't think that, but, but really when you talk about the weight, the preponderance of the weight in our program comes from displays. And most of those, well, it used to be 100%, we're down to maybe you know, 65 or 70% is still the old cathode ray tube, picture tube TVs and a huge amount of glass. Plastics are also another big portion of the output. Um, metals, a, a smaller amount, uh, and I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but, but you can certainly get those right off our website. Yeah, it would be the same for our program. It's all available on our website. And because there are so many battery chemistries that we accept, I didn't want to uh, have you glaze over <laughs> by looking at all the different chemistries and all the components. But if you are interested, it is um, available um, in our annual report that we post to our website um, every, what is it, June 30th every year. Yes, sir. Hi, I just have a question about how do you integrate with uh, the reuse component of the uh, three R's? Uh, in, in, uh, for example, uh, Free Geeks that re recycles computers and uh, Reboot Vancouver that just got broken into, those, those type of organizations. And, and so it, from our perspective, we really are an end of life program. So what we do is we encourage the reuse on the front end and say, you know, uh, we sponsor a, a site on, uh, on RCBC to, uh, uh, to facilitate exchange. Uh, but a lot of that takes place, uh, you know, on Craigslist and, and eBay and, you know, give it to your cousin and those kinds of things. So I mean, we very much encourage the reuse of particularly computers um, uh, on, the, uh, on the front end. Uh, and we've just recently uh, worked with Computers for Schools. They are now an, an approved reuser under our, I talked about that recycler qualification program. We also have a reuse standard, uh, and Computers for Schools was recently uh, approved to that uh, to that standard. So they are uh, a, a, an official reuser under uh, under our program. So businesses in particular, they're uh, you know, if you were to to contact us and you know say hey i've got you know i've got 50 good computers we would not suggest that you take those down to your local uh, uh, depot and uh, and have them recycled we would encourage those people to take those to uh, uh, computers for schools or another organization when you get into the you know the 20,000 metric tons of material that comes from consumers um, it, it's 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 problematic I'll say to try and and filter out the the reusable bits from that in a in a in a big commercial organization like ours um, there have been some studies done that would suggest that you know that around one percent of those are probably still reusable um, but it's not it really isn't economically viable to try and triage that out of the big group so that's why we really try and encourage that to happen before the material gets to us. Free Geeks is a good example. Like, like that's a, uh, we see that as a great option. If people want to take their computer in, refurbish it themselves, donate it to uh, to somebody else, uh, and then again on a on a business and organization wide basis, uh, some organization like Computers for Schools, we think that's great. So we'll recycle a question asker. Um, 
how do you trying to struggling trying to remember what it was like uh, half a century and more ago? But uh, how do you persuade uh, an 18 to 30 year old male to do something? Uh, an 18 to 30 year old female wants him to. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting you say that. It, it wasn't our ad, although we, we work, uh, uh, Encore does, uh, does a lot of our collection. They're, uh, they're the, they actually manage the network force. If you've, if you've seen their, some of their, uh, the series of ads they did uh, for recycling beverage containers, there actually is one where the girl leaves the guy because he's not a recycler. So uh, uh, that, you know, that really is, I guess, the question of the ages is how do you change behavior? Awareness is one thing, and, and quite honestly, that is something we're, we're shifting our marketing budget toward, is less awareness and more changing behavior. Um, but you know, one of the challenges with that 18 to 30 year old uh, male group is that, that traditional advertising methods don't work. They don't watch television anymore, right? They don't read the newspaper. And so the traditional places where you have advertised in the past maybe aren't getting that demographic. So again, we're shifting more to pr what they call pre-roll. So it's annoying as hell, but you know, when you when you do a video online, that little ad that pops up at the beginning, that's called pre-roll. That's where your your demographic is, and we're we're starting to shift more toward that, looking at social media uh, and some of those kinds of things to to do some outreach to that to that group. So uh, yeah, you have to change their behavior, but you have to get to them first. And, uh, and, and getting to them has been, uh, has been some of the challenge with traditional advertising uh, and marketing strategies. Yes. Um, hi. So just to, I guess, follow up on that question is how are producers being incentivized to change their behavior and design with materials that are more readily recyclable and have more value at the end? And I, I will, I'll say that I, I, I probably don't speak for all the producers of the world, uh, um, but this is kind of a pet thing of mine. Almost every regulation that's ever been enacted anywhere in the world has had this, this you know, encourage the, that first R I talked about, the, the reduce R uh, with, the, with the producers. And, and you know, you look at at let's say Canada's impact on the world market, because when you're talking about manufacturing a TV, it's a world market. Canada would maybe represent 1% of the sales worldwide, probably not that much. BC would represent, you know, whatever fraction of that that is. And so realistically for us to believe that EPR regulation will influence product design, I think is a pipe dream. That just isn't gonna happen. What does influence that is consumer awareness. So in my mind, changing the way the consumer thinks and changing the consumer's mind to put value on environmental issues is the way. So when you look at, at um, Dell has introduced bamboo uh, fabric in their speakers and they've done that because it's, a, you know, it's an environmentally uh, friendly thing to do. Um, you know, you look at, at some of the material replacement and some of those things, they have done those things for environmental reasons, and it's because you're seeing that. Um, one of the good examples, and I guess because they're my stewards, I won't mention them by name, but there was a, uh, the, one of the largest <laughs> manufacturers of electronics in the world had talked about dropping out of the gold star standard, which is the U.S. regulation around energy and some of that. And, and all of a sudden, people stopped buying their products. The city of, uh, of San Francisco canceled orders. And I mean, two weeks later, they were back in. So to me, those are the kinds of things that, that <coughs> genuinely change manufacturers' behaviors, much more so than, than EPR regulations ever would. If I can add to that, <clears throat> through my uh, work at Metro Vancouver, I'm also the chair of the National Zero Waste Council. And that is a group that has been formed for the, about the last two years. We're working right across the country with various stakeholders, governments, non-governments, business associations, and, and the like. And what we're doing there, we're focusing on the reduce aspect of the situation. So it kind of dovetails into your question and, and the presentation today. And the two main thrusts, two of the main thrusts that we're working on uh, really have been touched on by uh, the speakers. Uh, first of all, to persuade the product designers, 
uh, the designers of products and the packaging to be more conscious of the circular economy where you're trying to reuse that product at the end of its normal useful life and that sort of thing. And secondly, to change consumer behavior, to make people aware of the situation and to get them thinking along the circular economy and, and, and to think in those terms. So uh, this is way upstream before you get to the recycling component of it, but it does dovetail, and I can tell you Metro Vancouver is working on that aspect as well in a very big way. Other questions? Okay. Okay, I think we'll go to this gentleman. I think we'll probably make that the last question and we can uh, get to our business for the day. Yes, sir. This is more of a, my name is Ken. This is more of a philosophical question. Like 50 years ago when I started to buy fridges and stoves and washers and dryers and cars, they weren't run by circuit boards and so they would all last 50 years. Even a car would last 50 years if it didn't rust and, and I knew how to fix my you know, 1965 car. Now everything has got a circuit board. You're lucky if you get five years out of a fridge or a stove. And once there's a short, and there will always be a short with these interruptions in power and, and because the power supply is not perfect anywhere, there's a short's going to you know, re result. So it's, it, it's great that we have this electronics and computers and it works. You know, I work with them all the time. But you're not going to get 50 years out of them anymore. You're just going to get two or three. And so uh, are we better off? It's just a philosophical question. I think we should, leave, unless the speakers no, want to address it, I think we should take that. Good not to address it. That's an interesting <laughs> comment. I think we should take that as rhetorical uh, because uh, it does touch on a, a, a big part of the challenge uh, facing these speakers and facing Metro Vancouver uh, with its obligations as well. So. I think with that, I think we should bring this morning to a close. It's gone uh, quicker than some of them. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kristen Romilly, uh, Craig Weishart, Andrew Marr uh, for presenting to us today. I want to thank all of you for coming out this morning. It's always one of these things where a week ago it seemed like a better idea than when you were getting up you know, <laughs> early in the morning this morning. But these are important subjects and we hope that we've been uh, thought provoking. One of the one of the things you can take away from here is the organizations where they have spoken this morning, go to their websites or if they have other apps or, or whatever and certainly look at the Metro Vancouver We Recycle app because I think that there's a lot of important information on those uh, materials uh, that you can take away and use in a very practical sense. So uh, this uh, series of breakfasts, it's an important part of Metro Vancouver's outreach program uh, to outreach to the various communities uh, in the Metro Vancouver area. So the, what you're doing is important to you too and uh, to the entire region. So thanks again for being here. Uh, we haven't nailed down the date in February for our next breakfast, but it'll be probably around the 17th, 18th, 19th, somewhere in there. So watch for that. Thanks again for coming, and let's uh, finish up with a round of applause for our presenters. Okay, thank you. Good morning.